Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alaikum. Welcome to News Room. I'm your host, Nima Khalid. But today is the 21st of February 2024, and these are the stories that we will be highlighting during the course of the show. We'll begin with the upward rally that is happening at the Pakistan Stock Exchange as far as uh, today is concerned over the political stability. We all know that uh, the main political parties, that is the Pakistan People's Party and the PMLN, have uh, joined hands in order uh, to uh, form the next government. And uh, that has resulted in a very positive sentiment as far as the investor confidence is concerned and also the stock exchange in Pakistan is concerned. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, the Pakistan stock exchange gained around 1,000 points with analysts attributing these gains to the consensus over the formation of the new government. That and more have also happened. The US dollar appreciated by 21 paisa. Uh, the, the, the bonds also have uh, had a very positive outlook uh, because of this decision that has been taken politically. This and more is going to be discussed in our first segment. Our second segment, ladies and gentlemen, concerns the relationship uh, between Pakistan and the United States of America and the relationship between Pakistan and China. And how Pakistan, like in the past, was the bridge between the two countries could maybe pave the way for a bridge between the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. Pakistan's ambassador to the US, Masood Khan, uh, highlighted the pivotal role that his country could uh, uh, play, that is, Pakistan, in fostering cooperation between the US and China. He was talking at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And uh, he said Pakistan should, not, uh, should be a meeting point, not a battleground for the two global powers, and encourage both nations to invest in Pakistan's areas of strength. We'll be talking about Pakistan's areas of strength where both of these need to invest and of course uh, Pakistan's role uh, in this whole geopolitical and geostrategic situation. Then we are going to talk about the Indian farmers protest that has been going on. This is the eighth day of the protest as far as uh, the Indian farmers are concerned. Uh, the daily Chalo march continues uh, 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 and of course the number of farmers is also increasing. Their uh, demands uh, remain the same. Uh, for the moment there is uh, no uh, budging as far as the Indian government is concerned, uh, but the Haryana police con continue their violence against the Sikh farmers to uh, stop their march. The farmers' leaders have also rejected the government's offer of a new system and they have uh, threatened to enter New Delhi on the 21st of this month. This is uh, our third story and our last story, ladies and gentlemen, concerns the brightest object powered by the hungriest black hole that has been discovered in space. Now researchers have found uh, this brightest object which is 500 trillion times, 500 trillion times brighter than the sun. According to the European Southern Observatory, the newly discovered Quasar is the most luminous object ever observed and is powered by a massive black hole which is eating a mass equivalent to one sun per day, making it the faster growing black hole today. This is going to be our last rule. Let's begin with our first and that concerns the upward rally in the Pakistan stock exchange as well as uh, a very positive investor confidence because of the decision that has been taken by the political parties. We've been joined by Dr. Niaz Murtaza. He's a political economist online. Thank you very much, Dr. Niaz, who have joined us. I'll begin with my first question, of course, which is uh, the most evident. The Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz and the Pakistan People's Party uh, have uh, joined hands in a new administration and this has been jointly announced last night. How do you see this as a prerequisite for economic stability in Pakistan? Well, uh, obviously, you know, political uh, stability is a must for economic uh, uh, revival, growth, etc. So to the, that extent, it's welcome that you know we have uh, a permanent uh, government, or at least a long-term government, not permanent, of course, uh, but uh, you know uh, a government that uh, conceivably could last for five years, and that had been missing in Pakistan for the last two or three years. You know, towards the end of uh, the PTI government, there was this uncertainty whether it will last uh, till the end of its term, and then you know there was the 16-month a government which was obviously going to be short term and then we've had a fairly long uh, interim uh, setup so all that has you know kept uh, investors away uh, because they were not sure you know what kind of you know uh, policies uh, will persist in the coming uh, period and now that we have you know a longish term uh, government in place uh, that's why you see the stock exchange uh, reacting because you know uh, stock exchange is affected badly by uncertainty so you know since there has been an initial reduction in uncertainty so the uh, uh, stock exchange responded but also remember that it fell by about three to four thousand uh, points in the last uh, 
three or four days in the last week. Because so some of the uncertainty of again, I think we can attribute it to the uncertainty. But Dr. Yeah. Sab, I'd like to also, you know, understand this bullish trend, this increase in 1,000 plus points as far as the PSX uh, is concerned. Do you feel this trend is going to continue now that there is uh, a, a clear indication on how the new government is going to be formed? Well, I think, you know, the stock exchange goes uh, uh, incrementally and it goes in, you know, ups and swings. So whenever it sees, you know, a brief spurt of, you know, uh, a certainty and good news, it goes up. And whenever it sees, you know, uncertainty and some bad news, it comes back down. So for in order for this uh, rally to continue, uh, you know, uh, the good news and the reduction in certainty must uh, continue. Uh, and, and that means, you know, the government taking, oh, then, you know, unveiling the cabinet, what kind of people you are going to have in the cabinet, and then slowly, you know, the kind of decisions that they unroll. So if all of that happens, then yes, we can expect uh, the stock exchange to, you know, continue to rise because it's still, according to many, undervalued. But then, you know, that is the thing that, you know, the government has to ensure that, you know, it first of all appoints a competent cabinet, especially in the crucial economic areas like finance, in investment, uh, commerce, industry, IT, uh, social welfare. Uh, you know, the key uh, uh, ministry is that can play a critical role in giving a direction to the government and helping it you know adopt the right policies because what you need first of all is you know uh, 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 macroeconomic stability which has been you know missing for the last two or three years with you know very high inflation high current account deficit high uh, uh, fiscal deficits very high interest rates so the first task will be to you know ensure that there is a, a macroeconomic stability because on the back of macroeconomic stability only can you have the next and the much more important task of you know economic revival economic growth high growth periods high spurts six to eight percent growth that we need if you don't have this macroeconomic stability whatever growth you have tends to be very short term as you've seen in the last 10 years whenever we had six percent growth it was based on high fiscal deficits current account deficits lose money supply and the growth spurts just lasted, you know, a couple of years. And they were the cause of the crisis that we then had. So this is important to make sure that, you know, we first have macroeconomic stability and we'll have to go for an IMF loan and they will have to, the IMF will insist on that. So, you know, having, you know, key people in place whom uh, will give, you know, the trust to the markets and to IMF that Pakistan is now serious in undertaking, you know, the reforms that can ensure long-term investment productivity increases, the kind we see in India, Bangladesh, China, where you know, countries where you have growth which has lasted for over a decade, two decades, three decades even in China, and that's on the back of investment and productivity, which doesn't happen in Pakistan. Pakistan's investment GDP ratio is only 15%. Even India and Bangladesh is 30%. China is more close to 35-40%. So that kind of investment GDP ratio comes when you do serious reform. And we have a lot of areas where we need to do reform, you know, the state enterprises, uh, the power sector, the subsidies that we give, uh, agricultural reforms, uh, industrial reforms. So there's a whole raft of, you know, policy reforms that are waiting to be taken and in a lot of those areas you know the ideas are already there but we need teams that can implement so that's going to reforms dr saab is extremely pertinent now dr niaz mutasar let's begin with the uh, with the most important question for the next government the most important challenge that is the continuity of the imf program the current program is ending uh, in March and of course then comes the new program and the IMF uh, you know, wants to come to uh, and meet the new government or the representatives of the new government whenever it is formed. How much of an onus uh, or a responsibility is on the new finance minister and his team in order for this continuity of the program with the IMF and how much do we need support from the IMF in this day in Pakistan? Well, uh, you know, without the IMF loan, you won't be able to get anywhere because, you know, 
uh, other countries will not uh, uh, give you loans other uh, uh, bilateral and multilateral institutions will not give you loan commercial loans will be difficult investment will be difficult so you know the conditions of imf are very tough and some of them are also a bit unfair given the fact that you know uh, the country has been going through such high inflation there's also need to give some relief to the masses uh so that you know uh, the poverty that has gone up also reduces but you know that's uh, you know the suit that we will be dealt with we can negotiate with the imf and try to make the conditions a bit better but remember the last loan that they gave us was just a 9 month loan and that's why they didn't attach too many conditions to that now this time it will be a much tougher uh, loan uh, on you know fiscal deficit current account deficits energy sector uh, your state enterprises your subsidies uh, your exchange rate so it's going to be a fairly tough program and for that we need somebody you know who has the ability to instill confidence uh, in the global markets and somebody you know who the markets and imf and the global lenders will see uh, as someone who can uh, who does have the ability to deliver on whatever promises are made to imf so it's going to be a tough challenge and it will be important uh, we know already who the prime minister will be now it's his choice to you know select the right economic team and you know the social uh, development team that can you know ensure macroeconomic stability productivity investment and equity so that you know the masses that have been suffering for so long finally get some relief Dr. Niaz Murtaza, you know, you talk of you've talked of reforms, and I'd like now like to come on them. In the caretaker government, we had Dr. Shamshad Akhtar, who did, did a brilliant job as uh, the finance minister and initiated many reforms, including the structural reforms, including the reforms in the I FBR as well that have now uh, that are now taking shape. How important is the continu continuity of those reforms in this next government that is going to be formed, which of course um, uh, has uh, understands the necessity. of the continuity of these very reforms structural macroeconomic and others well as you can understand you know a caretaker uh, a government has a limited time period as well as you know the mandate and the authority to take the longer term decisions so as you can see you know some of the decisions that they were trying to take for example on pias privatization on fbr bifurcation uh, they were stopped by the election commission of pakistan which said that you know these are decisions for the new government to take place so obviously uh, you know the caretaker government doesn't have the authority but then it also doesn't have you know the public pressure uh, now uh, you know this government will have you know the authority but then uh, it will not uh, uh, it will also face a lot of you know public pressure having come to power uh, through votes and then you know there'll be a very strong uh you know opposition uh in the parliament very noisy very strong on social media with its own grievances about elections and so on uh, and it's certainly not going to be you know make the uh, job of the government easy so that is the challenge that the government faces it has to take a lot of tough decisions which will impose you know a lot of burden on an already burdened population and you'll have a very noisy uh uh you know opposition so you need your best hands on board uh you know this is the time to you know emphasize merit over all other considerations get the best people you can within your ranks and even outside the ranks if you have to uh, and you know if you look at uh, even the USA uh, the treasury secretary is the most important position there and in most cases you know even those very strong parties like the democratic party and the republican party which have been around for over 100 years each you know they normally go out of their ranks to appoint the treasury secretary so if you look at you know uh, yellen who's the current treasury secretary she is not a career politician uh, she was an academician and then you know she was in the federal reserve so she's more like a you know uh, uh, an expert rather than a politician uh so even uh, the usa does that to get the best person on board because you know finance and treasury of course are very technical term so that's the hard decisions that you know our party the coalition parties have to take place and just remember the finance minister uh, can only deliver macroeconomic stability the other things that i mentioned productivity investment creative 
solutions, you know, they have to come from your other economic ministries. So that's why uh, investment board uh, person, the commerce person, the industry person, uh, the poverty alleviation persons, they all have to be very competent people so that, you know, together this team can ensure macroeconomic stability, uh, investment and productivity, but also equity so that, you know, the growth doesn't just benefit the rich people, the elites, but that it filters down to the masses and, you know, gives them the relief that they badly need. Dr. Niaz Muzaza, not only uh, are we required to have a very strong economic and financial team, but we also need to have a more cohesive approach as far as the relationship between uh, the Federation and the provinces is concerned after the 18th Amendment, of course. How important do you feel is this approach to settle issues between the centre and provinces for fiscal discipline? Yeah, I mean, that's very important because, you know, uh, the provinces are, you know, the spenders. Uh, and, uh, you know, the federal government is the earner uh, and you know so uh, the uh, provinces don't have the same push uh, to you know uh, raise uh, uh, additional taxes or to you know spend uh, uh, you know uh, responsibly but then we've also seen in the past that you know whenever the federal government has made its demands for surpluses uh, the provinces have always delivered even uh, you know when you have had provinces run by the opposition party so you know uh, earlier on uh, when you know there was a, uh, a PTI government uh, in the center but PPP in province and reverse uh, normally they uh, did uh, used to come to some degree of solution but then I think the provinces also have to take more responsibility in terms of you know uh, generating more taxes and that means you know agriculture real estate property taxes which are very uh, under uh, utilized sources of taxation and that doesn't mean that you know that uh, uh, the transfers to the provinces must be cut uh, but uh, both uh, the federal government and the provinces have vast avenues for increasing their tax revenues because you know our tax gdp ratio is so low 10 to 11 percent and both have you know the ability to raise more taxes the federal government should do that to you know uh, start retiring its debt uh, and the provinces should do that so that you know they can increase their expenditure on uh, you know health uh, uh, education social services infrastructure so it has to be a team approach so then you know at least in three provinces you know you will have the same coalition uh, ruling and i'm sure you know even uh, uh, the kp uh, if they are given the right incentives they will also you know uh, cooperate because it's also in their interest at the end of the day to be able to you know deliver something to the people uh, and you know not be in this endless confrontation so hopefully you know better sense will prevail and you know people will look to you know working for uh, the people the masses rather than for their narrow party interests all right let's happen and uh, let's hope that happens dr naz murza final question you know uh, it's very important for under the current uh, geopolitical or geostrategic or economic circumstances to have a consensus amongst all the parties that form the government with the opposition on important issues such as uh, democratic values as well as economy. We have heard many a times uh, 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 talking of charter of democracy that of course the People's Party and the PMLN had established, then a charter of economy that has been talked a lot uh, in the past as well. Do you feel once this government is formed, uh, there could be a process for a reinitiation or, or reinitialization of this charter of economy, charter of democracy, and will all the parties come on board, including those in the opposition? What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, th uh, uh, there are areas where, you know, having, uh, you know, some agreement on economic issues would helpful. A charter of democracy was different because, you know, it largely pertained to, you know, the behavior of the parties themselves uh, in terms of, you know, doing some constitutional reforms, not undermining each other government. Now, economy is a bit different. It does involve the behavior of the government, but then it also involves, you know, competence in terms of, you know, uh, adopting the right policies and then implementing them with the help of the private sector. 
so uh, the, the charter of economy can help in some areas where you know mere agreement between the parties can help for example on the issue of you know agricultural tax on the issue of retail tax on the issue of you know what to do with state enterprises because whenever any government tries to tackle these issues the opposition raises a hue and cry even though when they themselves are in the power they might also uh, try to follow the same policy so if we can have some agreements on these contentious issues like you know real estate tax retail tax state enterprises uh, and so on there's a you know finite number of economic issues where agreement between the parties can certainly help but then beyond that to attract investment etc it also requires you know not just a charter of economy but a lot of you know creative ideas which governments can you know implement on their own but then you know since it's a coalition government where you have one party which is you know right of center and one party which is left of center uh, then obviously you know even to implement policies uh, they will first have to come to you know some agreement between themselves for example on state enterprises ppp's stance is very different from you know pmln so first of all they have to come into agreement on what they are going to do on state enterprises and uh, so you know they have to marry their different approaches and come to you know that, some that, that i totally agree with you dr saab the marrying of approaches is extremely important and the consensus is very important uh, for stability in pakistan in the coming months and years and of course also for the continuity of our reforms for the continuity of our relationship with the imf thank you very much dr niaz murtaza to have joined us thank for this very much. important segment on uh, the continuity of economic policies and of course the pakistan stock exchange that has uh, taken a turn for the better as a result of this announcement meant that finally uh, some leeway has uh, happened as far as uh, the upcoming government is concerned our second story ladies and gentlemen concerns pakistan's role whether it be vis-a-vis uh, -vis relations with the us or with china or to uh, be uh, to serve as mediator uh, between these two very countries how much of a possibility is that we've been joined by dr fazlur rahman he's the executive director of pakistan council on china he's right here with us in the studio so dr sab thank you very much to have joined us pleasure to have you here as always pakistan's ambassador to the us masood khan sahab he must have read the article on tuesday highlights the pivotal role that his country could play in fostering cooperation between the us and china what are the possibilities uh, of uh, pakistan exploring this domain well actually certainly pakistan has been enjoying good relations with china very good very cordial relations with china similarly there has been ups and downs in pakistan's relations with us but overall in totality it has been a good a uh, productive and uh, you know beneficial relationship for pakistan and the us especially in geopolitical and geo strategic terms uh, so i think that uh, this is not 1970s you know when pakistan was in a position to uh, serve as a bridge between china and the us now us uh, has been remaining a global power uh, since then and china has emerged as a global power uh, from from 1970s onward so now uh, they are at par and they are like in a in a position to really uh, play a very significant role in shaping the world so in in that context in overall global context pakistan i, I think uh, doesn't have that kind of a leverage to play a very significant mm -hmm. role but certainly what pakistan can do is to have um, you know sort of a cordial relation with both the major powers mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time i think the demand on the side of both the major powers is increasing on pakistan as to you know sort of choose uh, you know so sort of one of the sides because the strategic competition is becoming more and more intense with the passage of time how important is this balancing act that pakistan has been doing since the last couple of years as far as balancing the relations with the us and with china is concerned well we have been we have been quite successfully doing it and i think uh, you know sort of that is one of the options that, that you know the the current decision makers the policy makers are trying to uh, pursue uh, but at the same time i see i think you know sort of uh, it's becoming more and more difficult with the passage of time it will become even harder because uh if you look at the triangular relationship between us india and china and you look at the another triangle which is you know sort of uh, pakistan india and china so you see you know sort of uh, incompatibility of interest strategic interest so this incompatibility is certainly going to uh, you know sort of put pressure on pakistan to uh, see where its 
actual real uh, strategic interest lie you know we have multiple interest mm -hmm. we have global interest uh, and some of our interest are being served uh, by the us some of our interest are being catered by by the chinese side uh, but we have to really you know sort of uh, try to make a very fine balance which will become more and more difficult for us to you know sort of maintain that kind of a balance so we will be uh, adopting kind of a hedging policy you know sort of depending on the issues with both the countries uh, sometimes you know sort of we will move forward mm. and we would be looked at you know sort of like swinging on one mm. side or the other side but i think that's not really the case mm. the case is that you know it's more issue specific and situation specific uh, you know sort of this maneuvering of uh, our uh, you know uh, gesture towards both but I, I, I was uh, in China, you know, sort of a uh, couple of times in the last few months, and the sense, the kind of sense that I have got from Chinese uh, academic community is that the, you know, India has chosen its side, hmm. uh, and India has chosen the U.S. Hmm. And now it's Pakistan's turn to, you know, sort of uh, come out very clearly uh, about, you know, sort of what are its strategic preferences in terms of choosing sides, hmm. because we see that the constellation which is emerging, you know, sort of the U.S., India, especially in uh, their uh, Asia Pacific strategy. Uh, so uh, Pakistan, I think, um, uh, also have to become a more proactive uh, partner with a major power, a major player in terms of stabilizing the region, in terms of stabilizing the geopolitics of the region. Dr. Saab will also try to balance uh, uh, this segment out as far as the relations of Pakistan with the US and China is concerned. Ambassador Masood Khan, while he was talking uh, uh, on Tuesday, also said that the newly uh, new constituted uh, since 2023 Special Investment Facilitation Council prioritized sectors like energy, agriculture, and critical minerals for fast track foreign investment, offering incentives to these investors. Do you see that the, uh, the role of SIFC as being crucial, important to build strong economic relations both with the US and with the China? Well, actually, uh, you know, this is kind of an uh, institution, it's a structure which is created for wooing the foreign direct investment mm -hmm. into Pakistan by introducing some more favorable policies for the investors. So now it depends that, you know, how much incentives are being given to those investors within the current framework because there are several other factors, you know, not only the efforts by a certain kind of organization, but there are certain other enabling factors which would uh, attract the foreign direct uh, investment to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. As far as the Chinese investment is concerned, we have seen that, you know, sort of in the last couple of years, it has really slowed down. And uh, depending on, you know, sort of uh, uh, many reasons which, which the Chinese investors see. But as far as the potential is concerned, you know, that is huge. Mm -hmm. And that potential has been acknowledged and recognized organized all uh, the, in, in, in both the you know sort of partner countries in US also and in China also mm. but it the only thing is that we have to really create an enabling environment we have to assure the investor that there will be a continuity of uh, you know policies there will be restructuring in certain areas where the investors uh, have certain kind of concerns so I think by taking some adopting some uh, particular measures uh, we will be able to attract the foreign direct investment, but I think it's it's uh, going to be a like you know sort of hard nut to crack. We have to really make a lot of effort in terms of wooing the uh, foreign direct investment. And then those efforts are being made. We've had a lot of uh, new agreements that have been signed uh, between international companies and Pakistan of late. Uh, um, Ambassador Masood Khan Sahib also highlights Pakistan's economic standing, ranking as the 24th largest economy by purchasing power parity. And uh, he also talked about a young and tech-savvy population. When you talk of this young and tech-savvy population, how important is the role of this uh, populace in order uh, to, you know, accentuate economic growth in the country, whether it be through the China-Pakistan economic corridors and the different facilities that it provides for, or other initiatives in this regard, and build a, a stronger economic relation uh, with great powers that be or great powers that are, like China and the U.S.? Well, certainly, you know, sir, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge asset uh, for Pakistan, this uh, young population. But uh, unless until it is employed in a very uh, meaningful way into certain sectors, unless until it is, it is imparted with certain kind of skills, which can enable them to become an important part and important instrument in overall economic activity, I think uh, up, to, up till that time, you know, so perhaps we will not be able to really realize this potential. But that potential exists. And I think the state is working uh, to, you know, exploit that potential and try to make it more, more useful. So certainly, as far as the, you know, uh, the 
uh, the Chinese economy is moving towards more, uh, you know, knowledge-oriented economy, and they are relocating their industries and all that. So, in that context, we can benefit from Pakistan. From the U.S., I think certain kind of technologies which are uh, needed for like high tech uh, and you know, sort of some other areas uh, of uh, economic activity and uh, you know, financial investments, we can, uh, we should be looking for that also. So, I think from both sides, we can uh, take advantage. We can take benefit while using our you know, sort of the, the, the youth chunk, you know, which is um, in a majority, in, in a, in a majority uh, but uh, you know, sort of it could become a liability if we do not really focus on that in a more, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, particular way to enable them to become very uh, important, you know, instrument of uh, our economic activity. True. Dr. Fazul Rahman, we have a demanding macroeconomic environment, but Pakistan remains a very hospitable uh, country or, uh, you know, a destination for foreign direct investment. Do you see more of that FDI coming from China, from the US, from other important countries? And what should be the criteria for that FDI to increase over the next couple of months? I think again, you know, sort of the the the, the foreign direct investment from the West, you know, they they uh, they. Uh, specifically for uh, follow a framework, you know, in which they see the human right conditions, they see the, you know, democratic institutions, you know, viability and things like that. Uh, they see overall political environment, they see, you know, sort of uh, opportunities and sustenance of the policies and structural reforms which they have been, you know, the, the kind of taxes which will be uh, applied on, on, on their investment and things like that. So, their, their framework of investment is somewhat different from the Chinese, you know, sort of framework. China, Chinese investments are also uh, in the context of Pakistan-China bilateral friendly relations and they also see to, uh, they seek to help Pakistan in certain areas in order to, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, enable Pakistan to grow its uh, economically. So, Chinese investment, especially under the CPEC, I think will continue to flow into Pakistan. Uh, there could be some ups and downs uh, in, in the future, but I think for sure that, that is going to uh, come. But we have to then again create, you know, sort of an, an enabling environment. We should very boldly identify the concerns and the, uh, you know, uh, handicaps that the the investors are uh, identifying as mm -hmm. far as, uh, you know, the environment in Pakistan is concerned. And we should remove them and they will be coming into Pakistan. Now you speak of bottlenecks, you, uh, you speak of, you know, uh, the questions that uh, the investors have as far as Pakistan is concerned. And one of those is the continuity of the reform process. And reforms is also something that China has been talking about, the U.S. has been talking about. How important is for, uh, for us, for this upcoming government, for any upcoming government in Pakistan to continue with this reform process in order to stabilize its economy and attract investors because then they will see, you know, there is the proper reforms, uh, whether it be for uh, the macroeconomic stability or microeconomic stability is happening and we can come and invest because it is, an, as you said, enabling environment for it. I think it's abs absolutely cru crucial to, you know, sort of convey this sense to the to the investors that you know the reform process in Pakistan is going to continue. It's not going to be disrupted by mm. certain disruptive forces. Uh, so I think that unless until that confidence is given to them, and I, I, we can do that. You know the mm. thing is that we can do so many things which we, which we don't do normally. Mm. Uh, so I think that uh, there is no uh, you know glitches that I I could see w for implementing and continuing with the with the reform processes mm. and these reform processes should be very meaningful integrated reform processes you know sort of they should not be conducted or done in a kind of uh, isolated or standalone reforms there should be a comprehensive you know structure of reform so that each reform can supplement the other that is very important dr sab also how important is the role of the diaspora whether it be in the us or in pakistan mazul khan sab talks about uh, you know important uh, uh, diaspora which is estimated at 1 million in the united states of america and he says the us based diaspora's investments were 3 billion us dollars uh, similarly, in China, there is an important uh, uh, number of uh, Pakistani diaspora that are present, and of course, the businesses that both and the businessmen that go to and fro between the two countries. Uh, what is the role of the Pakistani diaspora, whether it be through the business community or for, with those who are staying in the respective countries, in order to further boost relations mm -hmm. in the economic front or in other fronts between Pakistan and the respective countries? Uh, I think the Pakistani diaspora, especially in the U.S., is very passionate about you know Pakistan, and they 
all the time are concerned about you know what is happening in mm -hmm. the country mm -hmm. they would like to see pakistan prosperous they would like to see pakistan economically growing and uh, becoming you know sort of a kind of a, uh, a part of the mm -hmm. uh, developing uh, you know process uh, mm -hmm. globally uh, but somehow i think pakistani diaspora is not that much organized as we uh, see, you know, some other countries have organized their diaspora in a very strategic manner. So we manner. need to take measures in so that regard. We certainly take two measures uh, in that regard, and we try to, you know, create certain kind of, you know, structures in which that diaspora can contribute more positively mm -hmm. and more proactively. For example, creating certain kind of consortiums, you know, small consortiums of business people or uh, certain, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, industrialists who are uh, in, 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 in the US uh, to engage them and to bring them, you know, sort of in terms of uh, foreign direct investment to Pakistan. And also, you know, so they are the ambassadors of Pakistan. So Pakistan's, you know, overall image globally, Pakistan's uh, overall presentation globally uh, is largely depending on, on all those, you know, sort of uh, people. I so I think they, they should be engaged properly and their concerns and their difficulties and their problems should also be catered, you know, sort of sympathetically. Masood Khan Sahib also talks about Pakistan being a key to South Asian security, South Asia's security. How important is security as a prerequisite for investment in Pakistan and stronger relations with important uh, global players such as China or such as the United States? And what can Pakistan do in order to further improve on that? We've had concerns from the Chinese side as far as security is concerned in the past as well, and Pakistan has adhered to that. How much is uh, how important is it in my point of view or in your point of view to uh, further consolidate on that? I think that um, you know uh, there are certain certain things which we can initiate which are in our control uh, to make like you know sort of good gestures towards our neighbors in terms of enhancing security stability for the region making it more peaceful making it more stable but somehow there are certain things which are beyond our control you know mm -hmm. for example the reluctance of indians to talk to pakistan or their reluctance in order to you know sort of create kind of an uh, more peaceful uh, environment re their reluctance to you know give some relief to uh, the Kashmiris, to uh, some other minorities which are concerned of Pakistan. So uh, from that point of view, I think there are certain things which are not in our control. Uh, but the things which are in our control, but here the major players can, uh, powers can play a certain role. Mm. Uh, especially China has always been uh, ready to, you know, sort of uh, offer its good offices for mediation between China, uh, between uh, India and Pakistan. United States uh, has more cordial and strategic relations with India, and they would have certainly kind of an agenda in which perhaps Pakistan doesn't fit you know, sort of uh, uh, in, in, in that uh, uh, way. But at the same time, as far as the stability and the peace is concerned, I think that is in the larger interest of all the players mm. which are operating or which are involved in this region. So as we, for United States also, the stability of the region mm. is quite crucial and very mm. important. All right. Thank you so very much, Dr. Fazal Rahman, Executive Director, Pakistan Council of China, to have joined us. I would have loved to talk more on CPEC, but I think that will be for another day. Thank you very much, sir, Thank to you. have joined us. Let's come to our last two stories very, very quickly. The first concerns the farmers' Dehri Chalo March that is continuing for the eighth consecutive day in India. Uh, the Modi government or the Haryana police continue their violence against the Sikhs, these Sikh farmers to stop their march. And the farmers' leaders have rejected the government's offer as far as a new uh, system is concerned. They have threatened to enter New Delhi by the 21st of February if their demands are not met with. They have also uh, said that, that they uh, plan to continue their march uh, as per se and of course uh, have rejected uh, the government's proposal to procure pulses, maize and cotton at the MSP through the government agencies. Uh, they have said that uh, either solve our problems or remove our hurdles. Uh, it has also been as per the farmers community say uh, to move forward. Now whatever happens next, the government of India itself will be responsible. So a lot of tension as far as India is concerned and with the uh, with the statement from the farmers uh, saying that they are going to enter New Delhi uh, on the 21st uh, that, that is today. So I, I don't know what, what is going to happen and how uh, the Indian government is going to control. The last time they managed to control it after a couple of months by negotiations but those negotiations the promises that were made were also uh, not fulfilled. That is why the farmers are back. Uh, uh, across New Delhi. Last uh, story concerns uh, astronomy and the brightest object that has been unearthed uh, that is powered also by the 
hungriest uh, black hole. And I hope you know the black hole. And if you don't, that will be for another day for me to explain uh, to you. Researchers have found the brightest object in the universe, which is 500 trillion times uh, as bright as the sun. And you can imagine 500 trillion times. Anyways, the European Southern Observatory, the newly discovered quasar, they say that the newly discovered quasar is the most luminous object that has ever been observed. It is powered by a massive black hole, which is eating a mass that is equivalent to one sun per day. And it makes it the fastest growing black hole to date. Now, quasars, what are they? They are the brightest cores of distant galaxies. They are powered by super massive black holes. That's the one that you can see in the parallel window. The black hole in this quasar is growing in mass by the equivalent of one sun per day, as I told you. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, uh, it's at the same time, uh, uh, you know, uh, very uh, strange to see developments such as these you would, that you had never thought of in the past of uh, you know objects uh, 500 trillion times as bright as uh, the sun or a massive black hole that are eating them we are all afraid of what happens if a, if a uh, black hole enters our solar system or even near our solar system what could be the disastrous effect of that that will be of for astronomers to tell us that another day another time but of course i wanted to inform you of this brightest object that has been now discovered 500 trillion times as bright as the sun with that we come to an end of today's newsroom we'll see you inshallah tomorrow with new story segments up and into us you in pakistan stay safe allah hafiz Thank you.